act of terrorism and are clear that there is no place for terror in Islam. Uh, the government's proposals appear to be somewhat draconian and to appear and to uh, enforce state involvement in religion. They also appear to spite the debate of fear of being labeled an extremist. So there are two questions here that I made, twofold. On what basis and evidence has this report been established, and critically, who has been consulted? Uh, and number two, and I hope the answer to this is yes, is the UK government willing to take on board the significant concerns of the Muslim community uh, about this paper, and can they be appropriately addressed at the highest level? Thank you, Ralph. Yes. I have uh, Mariam Khan as the final question for this round. Good evening, my name is Mariam Khan. I currently practice as a nurse, and as you can see, I observe the veil. I'd like to take you a few months back to the niqab controversy that took place in September 2013. One of the justifications given for the debates, documentaries and interviews that took place surrounding the topic of the niqab was that the face veil hinders a woman's contribution to society. As I've already mentioned, I'm a neonatal nurse and I managed to obtain that degree with my niqab on. So, my question to you is that do you think that it was suitable for a Lib Dem minister at the time to say that we needed a national debate on the niqab and what is your view on the veil considering the fact that so few females in the UK actually observe this practice. Moreover, I'm sure that many of us here would agree that Jeremy Brown's statement caused unnecessary hysteria and created more problems than it solved. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Jeremy Brown said that we need a national debate on the issue of niqabs. It's more about we need to actually be talking about this. Yep. Issue. So, uh, Aisha, there you are. Um, in answer to, to your question, um, look, there are two competing principles at stake here, aren't there? As you implied in your question, um, there's the right to free speech, which is essential to a free society, and uh, you know, freedom isn't just in the eye of the beholder. Freedom is something that uh, means that people will say things that other people don't agree with. That's the point of freedom. So there's that principle. And the other principle is to speak with moderation and sensitivity and mutual respect, particularly on issues of, of faith, which are you know, hugely important to millions of people in this country. And I'm acutely aware that what happened um, caused offence to many, many Muslims in this country. Um, acutely aware of that. Um, and what I would say is that the, the, the freedom to speak your mind, which is an essential freedom in, in our society and should not be discarded at the first sign of controversy, is one that of course needs to be tempered with moderation, with respect, with tolerance, and, and with the use of language and the tone of language which is, which is respectful and, and, and expresses the dignity with which particular issues of faith should be treated. And that's why uh, uh, the fact that uh, Majid, Majid Nawaz has uh, uh, said that he regrets some of the language that, and the tone that he's adopted is important. But more generally, I would say to everybody, this causes huge heartfelt concern. This inspires a great deal of anger. Um, a great deal of division, um, but it is essential that those differences of opinion, as sincerely held as they are, are conducted by everybody in a manner which is, which is more tolerant and more respectful than frankly was the case um, uh, you know, a short time ago. On the extremism task force, I don't actually accept the suggestion, I really don't, that this government has somehow been draconian in its actions. I don't think there's any evidence to show that at all. As I said earlier, we're the government, not least because of Liberal Democrats, who scrapped ID cards more than half the time in which people could be charged uh, without detention. And as I said earlier, that stopped the incarceration of, of, of young children for uh, immigration uh, purposes. That replaced control laws, which were not only draconian, but were also legally uh, insecure. And if you actually look at, the, you know, look at the, the report, as you know, there were some voices who said that we should immediately reach for the statute book and legislate for extremism as well. 
And myself and other people said, no, we're not going to do that because the case hasn't been made. So the report didn't say that was going to happen. The report said, we'll examine the case as one would examine the case for anything that is proposed. So I really would ask you to judge a government as much as you would judge any person by their actions and not what they're alleged to think. Because I really do think our actions have shown that each step of the way, not least because of Liberal Democrats in government, we have sought to strike the right tone and not overreact. Not overreact. In the past, I think previous governments, if faced by the horror of what happened in Woolwich, would have immediately, immediately introduced a whole raft of legislation, which they would have spent the next decade regretting. We didn't do that. In fact, the first thing I did as Deputy Prime Minister was to go out, citing some verses from the Quran, to say we must not overreact at a time of fear and at a time of mutual antagonism. We should keep a cool head and continue to uh, act in a spirit of generosity one to the other. And that is quite different, quite, quite different, frankly, to some of the populist and draconian gesture politics um, of the past. And it was a, a paper that was prepared with a wide consultation. And yes, of course, uh, those who may not like a certain provisions of it are and have been and will continue to be listened to it. The final question, as you know, at the time that um, uh, Jeremy Brown spoke out, I, I immediately said that I disagreed with him. Because much as I said earlier to Aisha, it's important to treasure and cherish the freedom to say what you want in a free society, I also think it's important to treasure and cherish the freedom to wear what you want in a free society. Of course there will be, as you know, very individual settings where that, uh, where that, uh, where that not, might not be the case. But the, the, the principle has got to be, much as I said earlier, the principle of liberty and of responsibility. The people being able to express themselves linguistically, but also sartorially, and in terms of the expression of their faith, and their community, and their identity, as they wish. That is what makes up the, uh, the diverse, plural and tolerant nation that I believe in. Um, Deputy Prime Minister, in regards to the issue of the cartoon that was produced, it's quite clear that you are understanding the defence that was caused. Of course. But you've asked uh, for that individual to apologise for his language because it was inappropriate. But do you appreciate also the need for an apology in terms of actually producing that cartoon, not in terms of limiting his freedom of speech, but for apologising for causing the immense offence which he has caused? Well, he has. Uh, uh, he has said that he regrets causing uh, offence and insult, as he has done, clearly, to many Muslims up and down the country. Um, but you know, as I said earlier, uh, this can only be solved, people can only move forward together, if everybody acts with, with, with moderation and mutual respect towards uh, each other. For the reasons we've just been discussing, we are a plural society. We are composed of people with different faiths, different communities, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different ideologies. That is what makes a free uh, and vibrant society. So we, I, we shouldn't seek to homogenize people, but we should seek to make sure that those differences are expressed with, with moderation, with restraint in the right language and with the respect that every person, particularly those of sincere faith, rightly deserve. I apologise because obviously this has been the burning question sure. that I wanted to ask. Would you ever yourself tweet out an image of this? No, of course I wouldn't. And I, would you... I, wouldn't I wouldn't dream of it. Of course I wouldn't. Uh, no, I, of course I wouldn't do that. Sorry, it's, I only react with it because it's a preposterous suggestion that I would do something like that. But you know, there are a lot of things that people do that I would never do. That I would never do. But I still will, will stand by the idea that in a society, people are able to do things that I might not ever do myself and other people might find um, offensive. That's the, the balance we're, we're, we're trying to strike. And, and the issue of uh, responsibility in terms of the national debate on Nikar, is that something which needs to be highlighted from an Islamophobic perspective? Because obviously the Liberal Democrats don't have influence over the media, but the media has a responsibility in terms of how it reports and sensationalises these stories. Oh, and of course the media plays a... Uh, a crucial role, but you don't want to invite a politician to start complaining about the media, otherwise you'll be here, you'll be here, you'll be here all night. Um, um, I, but I think it is, I, I do actually think it's really incumbent on, on everybody, 
in politics, in education, and in the media, to kind of speak with, with proportion and, and, and with responsibility about, about things that otherwise could cause a great deal of, a great deal of unnecessary fear and anxiety, and, as, as I think uh, the young lady there said to me earlier, can also intimidate uh, young, uh, young Muslims who feel that somehow their freedom of expression to express their own identity is somehow being frowned upon, or even worse, or even worse, uh, intimidated. Thank you, Mr. Prince. We're going to move to the next round.